Okay, more on roles, and in particular on the difference principle, which, uh, as I say, is where the action really is and where the controversy really is. So what I want to do in this video is say a bit more about how to understand the difference principle and then what the content, what its meaning is in the context of how we think of Kantianism and utilitarianism generally. Also, the degree to which the difference principle balances, ideally, hopefully, um, our intuitions about political equality on one hand and our intuitions about individual entitlement on the other. And that's really, I think, the fundamental challenge for liberal democracy, figuring that one out. I'm not kidding. That's, that's a real issue. This isn't a made-up issue in a philosophy class. But figuring out how to work out our commitment to political equality, which we are committed to, nobody in virtue of having more talent gets another vote or a higher standard of proof in a tort case, you know, there's all kinds of places where differences in ability don't matter a fig in terms of your political status. And then there's this um, belief we have that a certain amount of asymmetry of wealth and a certain amount of asymmetry of access to resources is quite consistent with our commitment to political equality. Working this out is, I think, one of the most serious challenges, particularly for present-day liberal democracy. And Rawls, I think, will be with us as an important theorist forever, precisely because his contribution to this issue is as powerful and as um, aggressive uh, as it is. All right, so the difference principle. Once again, uh, I hope it's clear that under the VI, if you are Max Minning, it just follows almost semantically, since you're interested in the best possible outcome for the least advantaged under the VI, you will accept whatever arrangement is the best for the least advantaged. And if the least advantaged are doing better under some unequal arrangement than they would under any other possible available uh, arrangement, then you'd accept that inequality. If, you know, the least advantaged has 40 and the most uh, advantaged has 70, but under any alternative, uh, say equality, everybody has 35, you'll accept the inequality, since under that inequality, you have more than you would under equality. In fact, that's one way of interpreting it, that the least advantaged under inequality is still doing better than they would under any possible equality. We don't have to get into it. The main, I, I, I think you have it pretty straightforwardly, uh, there is no alternative arrangement in which uh, the least advantaged does better, including equality. And you might say, how is this possible? Why can't we just distribute to equality whatever differences there are between parties? And obviously the answer is, well, if you can, then you will. But if in moving towards equality, there's a great deal less to distribute, then you might be better off living with a certain amount of inequality if the least advantaged do better under that than they otherwise would. <clears throat> You know, there are many, you know, for some of you, uh, maybe some of the socialist uh, states of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union are illustrations. You might have approximated equality there, but people will be doing, yeah, you might say this is probably true in present day Poland or in present day Czech Republic. Those with less are still doing better than they were under the, the equality of um, the Eastern European, I, it wasn't strictly speaking part of the Soviet Union, but under the socialist regimes. Equality is just a relation, a ratio. You and I have as much as each other when we have equality. Each of us has 10, that's equality. But if I have 15 and you have 25, I'm better off than we are under equality. That's Rawls's great insight. If there's inequality, but it's to the benefit of the one with less, what is the harm? Certainly under the VI, that's all you're looking at. How is the least well-off doing? In any event, clearly, that's, that's the sort of 
self-interested logic under the VI, the question that I now want to turn to is, how could this be? And the answer is obviously through incentivization. You want enough incentivization that people will exercise their talents. They will undergo education. They will put up with a certain amount of sacrifice. You want to reward certain kinds of efforts to make it the case that people will bother to, you know, put in those extra years to learn how to be a very good cosmetic surgeon or really learn how to be a good engineer or really, you know, uh, get some incentivization for working extra hard as farmers or whatever. You want to incentivize incentivize productivity so that there's more to distribute. Uh, many countries have learned this lesson the hard way. As I say, uh, when I was living in Britain in the 70s, the medical services were just overwhelmingly, uh, I don't want to say subsidized, but it would have been impossible to imagine the provision of medical care in Britain in the 70s without the enormous influx of medical professionals from South Asia who simply were unable to make a decent living in those countries at that time. That has ceased to be so. I think America went through a bit of a crisis with what it paid its teachers at one point along these lines. You have to incentivize the production of certain goods and services enough to get the, you know, a sufficient number of them to distribute them in a satisfactory way to the population. But how much should um, these uh, services be compensated for? just enough to allow the talented people or to enable the talented people to, you know, be incentivized to do this kind of work in the first place. It's a very complicated idea to work it out in detail, I think would require a tremendous amount of thought and effort. But in some domains, I think we kind of approximate it for what it's worth. I don't want to get bogged down in examples in this video too much, but I think we pay public prosecutors on the federal level about this amount. You can't pay talented lawyers to be prosecutors for the Department of Justice uh, unless, I mean, you can't get ta talented people to be prosecutors for the Department of Justice unless you pay them something, but they don't make anything like what they could make given their talent in a private firm. It's just uh, out of the question, of course but they're not making nothing and they're not making too little to support a reasonable life. Uh, if you were to pay too little, you couldn't get talented people to do this work. It's a very good example. I think it's possible that what we pay public school teachers now may be about this. If you paid a significantly less, maybe a significant number of talented people would cease to do the work but we certainly don't pay them excessively. This is very far from certain, you know, uh, compensations which are arguably far in excess of what they have to be. I gave the example in class of, say, the CEO of uh, General Motors versus the CEO of Volvo. You know, the American CEOs are compensated four or five times what their European counterparts are paid. Do we believe that they're that much more talented, that you couldn't get talented people to do this work unless you paid these numbers? Well, there's just no good reason to believe it any more than there's any good reason to believe you have to pay people the kinds of money you have to pay them to get them to be surgeons when you look at what people in, you know, Berlin or Stockholm get. So these are reasonably decent approximations of the idea. There has to be sufficient compensation to get the talented people to do this work, but no more. And the excess of the social product gets redistributed to the least advantaged. And so you get in places like Germany and Sweden, asymmetries of wealth, but nothing like what you have here. The asymmetries match the difference principle. Ideally, by that I mean the social product ideally is about what it would be even if the incentivizations were much, much greater. It's not like there's a dearth of talented surgeons or a dearth of talented executives in Berlin or in Stockholm, even though the compensations are perhaps half of what they are here. That's the model. Compensation, incentivization, reward for talent, but nothing like what they are when left unchecked under the veil of ignorance, if you're the, now you see, and we'll come back to this, that's allegedly what the point of this video is supposed to be, I may need to make a third, 
Um, now you see how important and substantive the max-min assumption is. The max-min is giving you the difference principle, and the difference principle is giving you this extremely aggressive social redistributive program. So now you got to go back and go, whoa, wait a minute, what's the justification for the max-min assumption? I can see how if you're making it, if we're assuming the parties are max-minning, you're going to get something like Sweden and not America. Fine, I get that. But what's the justification? Why can't we just assume that people will, you know, choose equal rights and liberties and then live with whatever their talent allows them to generate? That's kind of Nozick's argument against Rawls, which we won't take up because this isn't a class in political theory. I'm mostly interested in how this argument gives us a nice contrast with utilitarianism and a development of Kantianism, as well as a contrast to Kant himself, and we're going to get to that. But you see how the assumption of uh, the max min plus ignorant of your, ignorance of your level of talent is a very aggressive assumption because it gives you a very, very aggressively redistributive outcome. Uh, so perhaps it's time to turn to that. What is the justification for assuming the parties will max min? Well, there are essentially two. One Rawls makes in the very beginning of his poli political theory, when he first begins to make these arguments, that in light of the way in which you're choosing the basic structure of society, these are going to set your opportunities for your whole life, uh, conservatism is, uh, what's the word? Reasonable. This is not like going to Las Vegas and putting a couple hundred down on a spin of the roulette wheel. You're choosing the circumstances that are going to determine your whole life prospects. And so you don't want to take excessive risks. That's one justification. But as time went on, he begins to develop a more robust normative justification that the difference principle expresses a kind of commitment to Kantian equality in the political sphere. And I think this is right, and I think this is part of what makes this argument so interesting. Under the VI, Max Minning, you're expressing the Kantian thought that all lives are equally worthy of respect regardless of their talent in the marketplace. I'm going to repeat that because that's really the deep point here. And we believe it, but we're not really committed to it. That all lives are equally worthy of respect regardless of their talent to make money in the marketplace. And all lives are worthy of a reasonable life plan regardless of their talent in the marketplace. We have this view at certain points where all says, I'm just integrating the commitment we have in, with respect to rights and liberties to economic well-being. We don't think that somebody who's smarter than somebody else deserves an extra vote at election time. We don't think that somebody more talented at surgery than somebody else deserves a higher standard of proof in a criminal trial. Regardless of your talent, your vote is equal. The standard of proof is the same. And analogously, regardless of your talent, you know, your, I don't want to say entitlement, but, well, let's use that word for now. It's to a reasonable life plan that you should be able to have a family, have a certain amount of leisure, have, you know, two children, not lead a life of tremendous stress and anxiety because, you know, for whatever reason, you're not somebody particularly talented at earning money in the marketplace. This is the thought behind the VI's you assumption of the max min, that we're going to choose a principle of distribution that will make it the case that even the one who is not particularly talented at making money in the marketplace, which as I say, I choose to understand as the unskilled worker, even that person will be able to lead a reasonable life. That person will not be, you know, doomed to a life of ongoing stress and anxiety, which as we know, and this is Marx's insight since the 1840s, under capitalism is exactly what will happen otherwise. So under the VI, and then as I say, we see this illustrated, you know, the hospital orderly in Sweden has a reasonable life plan. He doesn't, you know, own a home in Portugal. He doesn't drive a BMW. But nor does he have anything like the life of ongoing economic penury that I think his counterpart in America or Brazil has. That's the point, that under the VI, we express this deeply Kantian idea that persons are worthy of respect regardless of their talent. On the other hand, the difference principle 
does make, um, I don't want to say allowances for, it does acknowledge the legitimacy of outcomes reflecting differences in talent. Whatever differences there are, are rooted in talent. The surgeon has more than the orderly, not because he's born into some aristocratic class, but because he has a talent the orderly doesn't have. I should say, the difference principle fully specified says something like, these differences in outcome are attached to positions or opportunities that are open to all under conditions of fair opportunity. So to make it work, you'd have to have a very good education system, even for the poor. You'd have to make sure that everybody has the same opportunities to develop their skills. But in principle, we're already committed to that, in principle. But um, the main point is, sure, we're going to acknowledge that some people will have talent, others won't have, and we're all better off if those talents are allowed their productive expression. The point of the difference principle, and this is part of what makes it so interesting, is it's an attempt to reconcile our Lockean intuitions of people being entitled to keep what they earn as a result of their effort or talent or imagination or creativity and our Kantian commitment to the equal worth of all, regardless of their talent, you know, and which we express in our commitment to equal liberties and equal rights and equal liabilities, regardless of differences in ability. So that's what's going on behind the Max Min. It expresses this deeply Kantian commitment to the equal worth of all. However, and I'm going to try and wrap this part up pretty quickly, notice that unlike in Kant, commitment to the equal worth of others here is cashed out by a willingness to get your hands dirty with benefits, with welfare, with avoiding pain and suffering. Rawls draws from the utilitarian handbook here in this extremely helpful way. You want to respect persons? Worry about their welfare. This is something that Kant never can do. But when Rawls worries about it, it's not as an average. It's from a standpoint that regards the particular lives of each as equally deserving. And I'll leave it at that for now.